everybody. Welcome to another bonus episode of What a Hell of a Way to Die. It is uh, Francis and Nate, and we're joined by Rolling Stone writer Seth Hart. Uh, Seth released a really interesting uh, article called The Fort Bragg Murders, which uh, came, I mean, come on, how can you how can you not love a headline that's uh, that's just like that? So uh, we're going to talk about the, these murders, but but Seth, how, how are you doing today? Hey, you guys. Thanks for having me. Uh, I'm doing well. How about yourself? Doing well. So, so Seth, you're, um, you're a reporter extraordinaire. Um, kind of, kind of give us a background on some of the, uh, the places that you've worked and, and, uh, you know, why, why the military, why is that something that you're reporting on? Uh, well, I was in the military, uh, myself for, uh, from 2003, to 2011. And, um, I had a previous career and, uh, you know, when I went to, to journalism school, in um, 2015 and 2016, I, uh, I, uh, it was a natural fit. I was able to report on, um, you know, military issues. Actually, it's interesting you, you asked me that. They, uh, in 2015 was, um, I think, when James Foley was decapitated in Syria, uh, sadly, uh, by ISIS, of course. And um, around that time, a lot of major news bureaus started pulling their personnel from uh, from Syria, and so there were really no Western reporters over there, um, and uh, with with I think very few exceptions. So the fact that I had been in the military enabled me to kind of pitch myself to employers, as saying like, "Hey, you know, I've been to that part of the world because I had I had you know done a tour in Iraq." Yeah, I'm going to Syria. I, I know what I'm doing. It's fine. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Like the funny thing is, it absolutely didn't prepare me in any way. For that kind of work, because obviously I think you guys were, were in the military as well and um, are our veterans yourselves. And, um, you know, as, as I'm sure you're aware, every time you go someplace, you know, you're with 30 other soldiers. You know, you never go anywhere except without, you know, a bunch of guys as backup. So it's completely, you know, irrelevant as in terms of being prepared for this kind of thing. But uh, it was enough to get, you know, Rolling Stone to sign off on a couple of uh, assignments over to Syria. And I've worked with them ever since. Yeah, it, uh, we we were particularly interested in this story just because w- both we report on I mean, reporting in scare quotes there, but we talk a lot about military and veteran culture. We have obviously a sort of a political focus as well, but a lot of things we talk about is sort of more for a civilian audience in the sense that I would say the overwhelming majority of our listeners are civilians, but who are interested in the military, but kind of perhaps blanch at the sort of like lone survivor American sniper style portrayal of the military. And it was funny when we read the piece because I, I was stationed at Bragg. I was in the Special Forces course, um, and I decided to get out of the Army, and so I left the course and got sent to Korea and got out. I was in the Army for about seven years. And um, some of the things you described in this piece about the general ambiance of Bragg really rang true to me because there's so much going on. There's so much shady stuff going on, and particularly the culture. I, I had worked with the Special Forces unit when I was on a, a TDY assignment in Honduras. The culture of sort of like we've always got each other's backs, even if we're doing crimes, was such a weird kind of thing that was acknowledged, if not directly addressed. And so that, to me, it seemed like that's not the sole point in your piece, but it seemed like a big centerpiece there was that there is this culture of getting away with it in the special operations community, particularly at Bragg. And you highlighted a case of uh, a friendship between a Green Beret and a Delta operator that turned into them both dying. And I was wondering if you, just for the, we're going to link to your piece, but for the purpose of our listeners, could maybe summarize that and then maybe talk about like what your entry point into the story was. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think I first read about it. It was widely reported, this double homicide that took place right on the outskirts of Fort Bragg in a forest that the army uses, I I believe, as a parachute drop zone. Um, And it it was picked up, I think, by, you know, the New York Times, Washington Post, as well as all the local um, all the local outlets in uh, North Carolina. And uh, basically it was like, you know, the, it, it's hard not to compare it to the opening scene of um, No Country for Old Men where, you know, you had Llewellyn Moss comes across, you know, the fallout from this firefight and just everybody's dead and there's just a bunch of shot up trucks. I mean, it was nowhere near that extreme. It didn't involve that many people, but it was uh, one vehicle and there was two dead guys. Um, one was laying on the ground, one was in the back of the truck. And uh, very quickly, um, I think uh, investigators and the, the public who are reading about this realized that something was um, very unusual about this case because the, the guy who it was it wasn't just the position of the bodies it was the fact that there was there were uh, shell casings on the ground um, 
but there were no firearms. So there were, clearly was a third person who had been present, but uh, had 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 left, and you know, no one knows who that person is to this day. Um, or it could be multiple people. Um, and uh, anyway, the guy in the back of the truck um, who had been shot multiple times in the chest and appeared to have been killed in his sleep, as I wrote an article, because he was wearing uh, just a pair of ranger panties and he was wrapped in a whoopee, um, placed in the back of the truck and then driven out into the woods. Um, and that guy was named William Levine, William J. Levine the, the second, And he was a Delta Force operator um, who had been in the military for, uh, I believe, 19 years and was one of the most experienced, you know, tier one operators that, that you can imagine. And the other guy who was laying on the ground was um, was not like that. And to this day, no one really knows what the connection between the two of them are. His name was Timothy Dumas, and he had been dropped with a single shot to the head. Um, and he had been in the military, but he was, or excuse me, he had been in the special forces, but he was support staff. He um, was a property book officer, which I believe is a, just a, like a supply sergeant or a supervisor of supply sergeants. Yeah, I think, I think I'm not a hundred percent sure on that, but I would reckon that, yeah, he was probably like a, like for the, a group or for a battalion property book. So he was, didn't you, I think the, the piece said he was like a sergeant first class or a master sergeant. Right. I think he was a sergeant. I think he was an E7 when he got out. Um, like Levine, he had, uh, got out just, well, Levine never got out. He was on active duty when he died, but he got out just shy of 19 years, which I didn't write this in the piece, but you know, it's kind of interesting that someone would get out of the military after 19 years because if they just stay out for a few months longer, they can get retirement. That, yeah, that, that one really kind of rung to me too, because it said he got out after 19 years. Like there's, and, and knowing the military, there's a story behind that. There's a reason for that of some kind that, that probably rolls into all of this. Cause I mean, I got out at 20 years and four months. It's not oh. that hard to do the last little bit. Yeah. Right. I got out at seven years just so I could get full GI bill. Like if something 19 years is a long time to spend in uniform, if you're not getting that paycheck for life. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, someone quickly within a day, someone had leaked to CBS that both of these guys were under investigation for trafficking narcotics at Fort Bragg. Um, that's an anonymous leak. It comes from a, you know, just an army official, they say, which can mean anything. Uh, that can be, you know, that can be some first lieutenant who doesn't know what the hell they're talking about, you know, leaking something to a, to a CBS reporter for, at a bar or something. Um, so take that with a grain of salt, I would say. But everything I was able to come up about these guys um, strongly indicates that both of them were deeply involved in some kind of, um, some kind of organized crime, um, and involving drugs. And, you know, everyone who I, who knew, uh, Billy Levine that I was able to speak to told me that he was completely strung out on, you know, five different substances, but particularly cocaine. Um, Dumas was a little bit harder to get information on because he, um, well, he was just a harder guy to get information on. I tried, I knocked on a lot of doors and I tracked down a lot of leads, but it was incredible how many times he'd been arrested. I mean, he must have been arrested um, ten different times in all the little counties around. Uh, excuse me, all the little towns around Fort Bragg. Um, I, you know, I submitted FOIA requests to, to every single little town on the periphery uh, of the of the base, and it seemed like all of them came back with some incident where he had was kicking down someone's door, or shooting a gun through the window, or beating up a woman, or in one case in Carthage, North Carolina, he'd been arrested for smacking a woman uh with a bag of mcdonald's hamburgers um he had been arrested for impersonating a cop for making terroristic threats and uh i met a woman um a police detective in the town of bass who actually rented a house from dumas one of the most random connections i was able to make um pure luck you know reporting wise who told me that dumas had offered to kill her husband for money on one occasion so even though I never was able to talk to anyone like a close family member or anything like that, it all created a picture of a guy who was, um, you know, a very, I would say very dangerous, uh, unstable, um, person. Um, and, but, but the connection to, to Levine again is completely, um, completely mysterious. I mean, I, this is pure speculation and I really would hope that people do take it with a grain of salt, not just rhetorically, but, in all honesty, like I have no proof of this, but if I had to guess, you know, what exactly had happened between these two men, how did they ended up in the woods, you know, laying dead next to one another? It seems to me from everything I was able to learn about Dumas, the position of the bodies, the fact that there was no connection between them and the, the fact that Dumas had, you know, had been known to go around offering to kill people for money. 
suggests that someone hired him to kill uh, Billy Levine. Um, and then when he drove the body out to the woods, I guess, to collect his money, he got you know, wrapped up as a loose end. But why that would be, why someone would want to do that um, is, is, uh, is, a, is a absolutely an open question. And there was a couple of things too that, and there are like broader points in the story. It seems that a lot of these guys had been arrested, but it struck me, and, and perhaps I read this wrong, but it struck me in my read that none of them ever actually had charges stick, that these places drop charges, even in the case of, um, correct me if I'm wrong here, Levine murdering a guy, killing a guy, and then deciding it was justifiable homicide, but, or that, uh, but like it sounded from your reporting, like it, to me at least, reading it, like he, just straight up murdered a friend in a rage and then the charges were dropped or they, they weren't even charged in the first place. He wasn't even arrested. Wasn't even arrested. Yeah. You know, uh, that's absolutely right. Levine is the real, you know, I would say main character of the story because, um, you know, the, the unit that he belonged to Delta force, um, you know, it's not just the name of a cheesy, I think eighties action movie. You know, it's a real unit. Um, that is, uh, you know, I would describe it as the most elite military unit in the United States. Of course, you know, SEAL Team Six guys w- w- would. Yeah, that. It, I've always heard it described as the most selective unit in the entire Department of Defense. And the only anecdote I know about it is, and you touched on this a little bit in your piece, is that I mean, I think about it. I went through the Special Forces course, the Selection course, and everything, and then the Q course. Yeah, selective, great, but like the Q course, you know, they bring in. I think my my class, we had like three hundred something people start and like one hundred and twenty finish. And, you know, every year there's a selection pumping out about in and around that number. So you have, you know, 1,500, 2,000, 2,500, I'm not sure, around that many selectees going to the Q course every year. Whereas if I'm not mistaken, Delta selection is by invite only. It happens twice a year. And it's not uncommon that they will select none of the people that they invite. Like it's so unbelievably selective that, yeah, it's just, it's almost the stuff of legend. I know one guy who went and he broke his hip. <laughs> and I, it's, it's a wonder he was able to even stay in the army after failing selection. Like literally it fucked him up that bad. Wow. Yeah, that's consistent with what I know about the unit as well. I, I've heard that they struggle to fill, fill their uh, personnel ranks uh, year, year to year because people just can't meet the selection criteria or they're just so selective that they just will look at an entire class and just say no thanks and not select anybody. You really have to be an exceptional soldier. Um, I think that, so I met a guy once who, uh, uh, well, I, I, let's see. I, maybe I I won't say his name for for now. Uh, you, you can catch him on Fox News. He he used to be a, Fo- a, a Delta Force Colonel, um, or maybe he was the LTC. I can't remember exactly which, but he was a high ranking Delta Force guy. He was the liaison between Delta and the CIA during the Iraq War. Um, so he was in the thick of it. Um, and he, you know, we were riding around and and hanging out in North Carolina a couple years ago. Uh, when I was working on a different story and he was telling me about the unit and he told me, he said he was involved in selection and he had a lot of interesting insights in, into the process. One thing that he told me was that he would look for, you know, the number one uh, criteria, of course, is going to be marksmanship. You have to be able to shoot the ass off a fly at 100 yards. Um, these guys are prodigies. All of them are prodigies at shooting. Um, uh, and then, then besides that, he would look for more, um, you know, more, I would say, personality type of traits, which is not what you might think. They're not looking for macho, aggressive killers. They're looking for more like introspective, creative people. Um, he told me he looked for guys who that, pay, that, that played uh, musical instruments or that painted because he thought that that would, uh, you know, would be a proxy for people who are able to think creatively, you know, because these are people who have to operate for long periods of time behind any lines or completely alone. Um, so by the way, he also told me, this isn't relevant to the story, but I found it interesting. He also told me that there were women in Delta Force going back all the way to, um, 2000, at least 2004, because he told me that there were, uh, there were male, female teams that they inserted into Fallujah, into Fallujah before the second battle there in November, 2004. Yeah. I knew a guy who was in Ranger Regiment and he said something, he's like, yeah, it's kind of an open secret and soft, but yeah, there's, there's women in Delta Force. Yeah, that's so crazy. I had never, I, I would have never imagine that because, of course, women weren't allowed into infantry. Yeah, until I, think. I mean, I don't know if you were combat arms, but yeah, there was like this, this, this real like chest thumpingness about that. And Ranger yeah. Regiment certainly, my the vibe I got from the times I worked with them was yeah similar. Well, all that being said, you know, we should take it with a grain of salt. These people are also self mythologizers. Yeah. Um, the U.S. did like, lest we forget, lose the Iraq War and the war in Afghanistan. Yeah. Um, there's been a lot, a lot of ugly things that have gone on behind the scenes. And, you know, another thing is that like, you know, just for example, take that anecdote right there about the male, female teams. He told me that they had gone in to Fallujah and disguised themselves as school teachers. Uh, 
before you know the marine before the first uh, uh, marine expeditionary force invaded, and I, you know you get to thinking about that for a while. It's just like I mean, I've been to Fallujah, I've been to all over the Ambar province of Iraq, and it's, I, as a journalist, of course, not trying to be in disguise. It's like really you have the. I mean, first of all, I, I, it's known that like there's very few Delta or Arabic speakers in the whole you know U.S. government yeah. and the military. Too. There are very very few Arabic speakers. Plus, these guys, when you look at them, I mean, we've seen pictures of Billy Levine. It's like, it doesn't matter how good you are at disguise or prosthetics. It's like, these are people in Iraq who know, they'll know if you're from Mosul or Ramadi yeah. by the time you get done ordering a shawarma because of your accent, yeah. because of your you know, accent. And they're very attuned to who's an outsider, who belongs there, who's up to what. They know your whole family, etc. And so it's like, well, you guys really went into Fallujah before the battle and rented a house and pretended to be school teachers. I don't know, man. I, I don't know. A lot. Of, it's very hard to sort truth from fiction when talking about units like this. There are a lot of um, discrepancies a lot when it comes to how special forces operates for like how they say that they operate versus, you know, when you see the, the information come out, like the what's his name? The, the lone survivor guy. Like I recently Trail, yeah. was. Yeah, I was reading about his, um, you know, the the story that that the special forces tells, and then there's like also this Afghan who was you know involved in in the whole thing, who was just kind of caught up in it and helped the Americans out. And he's like, none of this stuff ever happened. The special <laughs> forces guys were super loud. Everybody knew they were coming. Mm-hmm. They got ambushed because they were like fucking with goat herders instead of like mm-hmm. looking for who they're supposed to look for. So it's not it's not surprising to me that that a bunch of uh, dudes with beards and six foot four with gigantic biceps were like, yeah, we can get away as being school teachers in Fallujah. <laughs> we're the most Fuck yoked off, school teachers in all of Iraq. <laughs> yeah, it, it's funny. To, to be fair, to be fair, I have a uh, charter school in St. Louis called Lift for Life, which is all about uh, being a, I shit you not, man. Oh, I believe So it. maybe, maybe it works. So I was just going to, I was going to throw this in that when I was in Honduras, my Sergeant major for my unit, uh, the army forces contingent at joint, to- joint, yeah, joint task force Bravo was an ex-Delta guy, um, and the man had the whitest neck I've ever seen in my life. He was the worst NCO when it came to drill and ceremony I've ever encountered because he went Ranger Regiment as a private and then went to Delta as an E5, got selected to state in Delta. But he had gotten kicked out of Delta because on the way back from doing some secret squirrel shit in, um, you know, via Ethiopia to assist their war with, with Al-Shabaab in Somalia, um, he had misplaced a top secret hard drive at the Addis Ababa airport. Uh, so they're like, yep, yeah, you're not going to be a sergeant major in Delta. Sorry, dude. Uh, but one time we did a trial army 10 miler race at, uh, at, um, Soto Cano air base and he ran a 56 minute 10 mile. So like the dude was in insane shape and I'm sure he was like, I mean, having friends of mine who have gone lived, for example, in Southern Pines next to people who are in the, 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 the Delta operator course, like just the sheer volume of shooting they do. Like, I'm sure the guy was, like you said, like a literal, you know, like savant with guns. But yeah, he, (laughs) there was also, you got the impression of a dude who had a perhaps unrealistic assessment of his own abilities and um, could could run like hell, which apparently is enough for a lot of things in the army. But um, Uh, I was going to say, we've all been in the army long enough to know (laughs) that promotions are based on how fast you can run. (laughs) Yeah. How good you are at stuff. And to be fair, I've lost a lot of things of the army's. And I've never been dismissed. So it is it is curious that it's like, oh, yeah, well, Delta is the one time. unit where if you lose something, you actually <laughs> go down for it. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, bringing it back to your story, though, it's just wild to me because when w- there are like you, you mentioned this in your piece, there's, you know, the, the, the estimates from people who are in the know is there's an around 250 actual operators in, in you know, SFOD Delta um, and, you know, some support staff as well. So, like, the fact that, like, not only is this a real live guy, but he's out committing crimes and doing drugs and then gets murdered. It's a real shocker. Yes. Whatever the unit's true uh, capabilities, it's safe to say that Billy Levine was, you know, one of the most elite soldiers in the United States of a very small number. And we, shouldn't all, we should also not forget that these guys are also um, routinely involved in decisions and actions that, that involve very high level, like political uh, outcomes. I mean, because of the nature of the work that they do, um, you'll often find that like Delta force operators have met like other heads of state or have been around, you know, right there. We're in the room when, when major historical events took place. 
Um, I was just reading a case about, you know, uh, an attack that took place on Hamid Karzai in, in Afghanistan in, I think, I believe 2002, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, another case where there was like, you know, Delta operators were instrumental in ushering, um, I, I think his name is Jean-Paul Aristide, the former um, ruler of uh, Haiti, or president of Haiti, I should say. Um, you know, and there was a Delta guy who was instrumental in like personally talking him out of his office and getting him on a helicopter and putting him onto the, uh, a flight to, to, I believe, the Central African Republic. These guys who are, and then of course, you know, they killed Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi in 2019. Uh, they captured Saddam Hussein. It was Delta guys who pulled Saddam out of a, out of a spider hole into Crete. Um, they've been involved, you know, you, you'll find that these guys have been involved in very, very high level things. Um, that, and, and Levine's father told me that, you know, from 2006, 2018, anything that the U.S. was involved in, he said he was there. Um, and I don't doubt that because of, you know, even if the unit may be guilty of self-mythologizing or maybe if these guys were leaking or talking about it or exaggerating in some ways, like they're absolutely in the thick of it. Um, so the, for, for this guy to turn up dead in the woods, uh, you know, shot to death, it is very, very strange, um, I would say. Um, and it raises a lot of questions because Delta Force, another thing about Delta Force and JSOC more generally is that for all of the sort of vaunted um, image of the CIA that exists in people's minds, over the past 20 years, I think JSOC has more and more edged the CIA to this, to one side, um, to where now they're doing, you know, because they used to say, you know, Intel drives operations, but, you know, their rock war turned that on its head completely because it was operations that were driving Intel. They were going out. You know, kicking down doors, killing people, grabbing their phones, grabbing everything in their pocket, grabbing their laptop and their, their hard drives and everything, um, sweeping it all together. And then from that, you know, making another list of, of, of phone numbers and names and going out and killing all of those people. Um, and, you know, especially in the, in the, in the second, uh, I think, Obama administration, or, or in the, at least in the second half of the Iraq war, let's say, from 2007 to 2011, um, the U.S. priorities increasingly became about just kill lists. Um, and it was Delta Force and Team 6 that were, that were doing all of that, going out and killing people every night, um, which is, you know, not what the unit was originally designed for. The, the, those, both of those units are, are meant for hostage rescue, se- securing loose nukes, things like that. Yeah, it's funny um, because, yeah, they're, they're one of the things, yeah, the, the way that you used to have the, sink, the commander-in-chiefs uh, in extremist force for like every combatant command in the military was a special a special forces unit like a, a like a team within a special forces uh group but it's basically been supplanted by what you just described like these guys becoming the sort of jack of all trades of direct action um you know i, I met a guy who was a surgeon who had worked with i think as a, a sustain a sustainer for delta and just described that like yeah it was getting deployed every year and opping every night and one of the things you guys you described in your piece Uh, Beyond, there was a line that I really appreciated. I think it was a quote from one of your sources that, you know, these guys are basically stopgaps for bad policy, that they're they're the ones who go out and execute this stuff, but that this has an effect on people. And, you know, and like, I think it was Billy Levine that you described had like a traumatic brain injury from getting blown up in Tajikistan. Like, there's the first thing that came to my mind. I mean, there was some stuff today in the news about clashes between the Kyrgyz and and Tajik uh, forces. But like, the first thought that came to my mind was like, what the fuck is this guy doing in Tajikistan? And exactly. then I realized I'm like anywhere, anywhere in the footprint of CENTCOM or if they're opting in like user pack or, or PACCOM like in the Philippines or whatever, like these guys are there. And like if someone's getting shot at it to them and then apparently that's also led to this culture of, I mean, I, it doesn't surprise me that the same kind of culture that produced the guys realizing like, hey, if you can convince a doctor to give you this kind of shot and your steroid shot in your neck, it can help with PTSD, even though it's totally not licensed, is the same culture of like, hey, we can totally smuggle cocaine in a punching bag, like the guys from, um, from 7th Special Forces Group got caught doing. Uh, I think there was this guy in, in one of your sources, you said, it sounded like, correct me if I'm wrong here, you literally interviewed him that he's in prison for trying to smuggle cocaine into the United States, like a large amount. Yeah, I wish I could have included more of the... I didn't interview him. He's been writing me letters um, from prison. I'm sorry I can't name him. Uh, he asked me not to, but uh, what you said about him just now is correct. Um, he had a lot of interesting insights to say about that. And like a lot of Special Forces guys, was uh, you know was very intel- he seems very intelligent from his writing. Uh, he doesn't seem like a meathead. Um, and, you know, what he, he said that he was making a lot of money because, you know, another thing we should talk about or maybe want to talk about is that 
uh, it, it pays well. You know, the military yes. has never paid better than ever. The military pays better than ever. You get all kinds of, um, you know, I don't know exactly how to describe it, but between combat pay and hazard pay, and I, I, I imagine there's probably uh, professional pay, pay, like professional pay for demo, for free fall, for scuba, language and pay. Then you don't, and then you don't pay taxes on it yeah, when, when you're, you're deployed. Yeah. So he told me he was pulling down six figures as an, as an E7 and deployed to Colombia by himself, by the way, which I found really interesting. Um, and he said he was, it was more boredom than anything else that, that, uh, that, uh, you know, pushed him to, to get involved in the drug game. Yeah. He got involved with a very, very large quantity of cocaine that he's bringing back on a military aircraft. It, it, it does seem like there's a, um, uh, an attitude of adrenaline junkie to it because like, you know, prior to nine 11, I'm sure that we used our special operations forces for things all over the world, but probably not to the extent that we use them now, which is deployment, deployment, deployment. You come back, uh, you run around uh, acting like an asshole, and then they slap you back on a plane and send you back out to go get shot at or to shoot people. And like, I, you know, regardless of who you are, like you don't kill multiple people and come away from that you know, w- without some kind of, without some kind of trauma to yourself, sure, whether, sure. whether it's meant. And then also, you know, roadside bombs, uh, mortars, um, just being around all of these things can, you know, rattle your brain or anything. And we've turned, yeah, we, we just create like, it's, you read this and you think, you know, Oh, these special forces guys are crazy. What's wrong with them. It's like, we did this to them. Like we're, we're the one rattling, rattling them around so much. And then standing around like, wow, it's crazy that they're getting involved in the drug trade and killing each other. Like, no, it's not. That seems very normal for a person who has probably been blown up seven times and still yeah. standing. And we've been kind of circling around a lot of this stuff. And so um, let, me just put, let me just state explicitly what the kind of thesis uh, that I was pushing or trying to uh, bring across in the article, uh, you know, not, which is that the, it's the combination of 20 years of war. And all the trauma that comes with that, like you said, you know, killing people inevitably impacts your psyche. Um, and I don't, I don't think you have to be personally responsible just to see someone get killed, I think, um, blows back against your, your mind and it's going to have repercussions. Uh, then there's also on top of that, this sort of cultural adulation that's heaped upon the special forces where they're constantly, um, you know, held up in, in, in movies and TV shows and books and so forth as these kind of supermen. When in reality, you're really not. There's really no such thing as Superman. Your body is very vulnerable. Your mind is very vulnerable, um, and it damages you. All of this stuff damages you. Uh, and then I think I think most importantly is the fact that the Iraq War uh, was for nothing. It was based on a lie, uh, and the fact that the, we lost the war in Afghanistan um, after all these years of being over there, and the fact that all of this was for nothing. That it all comes to naught. And as hard as that may be for some people to hear, um, you know, especially folks that have served a lot of tours that have been in the military, um, there's just no way to avoid that conclusion. Um, and I, you know, I, I don't think the blame rests on the military so much as on political leadership, but all of that creates, you know, the sort of perfect. Oh, and then I guess, uh, lest we forget, you know, the, the, the ex- huge expansion in special operations that have taken place for the last few years. I mean, it's massive. The SOCOM has 70,000 people now which is, you know, bigger than the military in most countries. Um, everything that they do is secret. They're shielded from scrutiny in every way. All of it creates kind of like this toxic, um, you know, or I should say it, not toxic, but it creates, you know, the perfect conditions for guys to sort of branch out and just do whatever the fuck they want. You know, it's, it's, it's funny. Uh, very little shocks me at this point. You know, like the culture of impunity thing. I saw that when I was in Afghanistan a ton because invariably, you know, we were the landowner unit. I was in a regular infantry battalion and... Um, you know, SEALs, whomever would operate, kill civilians, and then we'd be left holding the bag. And they'd always come up with, you know, some like uh, exculpatory PowerPoint slide that proved that like actually they didn't commit war crimes when they had very obviously murdered people. And, you know, the stuff with the theft. I mean, a couple of guys I worked with in Honduras went to prison for stealing SERP funds. They were seventh group guys. A lot of guys got in trouble. You know, I've read, obviously, I followed the Rolling Stone reporting about uh, the kill team and those guys in Afghanistan who basically were just killing civilians and then manufacturing like a a troops in contact situation so they could either just for fun or because they could get awards, that kind of shit. You know, I followed this stuff even when I kind of zoned out after I left the military. But the the thing about this story that really genuinely shocked me was this guy murdered a Green Beret and had been committing, apparently, very obviously, a lot of these guys had been committing crimes. 
in the open being arrested and just had never been charged. That like they that they dropped the charges that many times. I was floored by that. So for your listeners who maybe haven't read the story yet, or also Jack Murphy has also written on the same um, uh, incident between Mark Leshiker and uh, William Levine. So Mark Leshiker was not Delta Force. He was uh, he was a Tier Two operator. Just I think he was a I think first Special Forces group. Um, but they were best buds. Um, they had met up at Fort Bragg at some point. Uh, both of them were heavily into drugs. Both of them drank a lot uh, of liquor. Both of them uh, popped pills, um, right and left. Um, and they also did a lot of MDMA. This is, by the way, coming from um, Mark Leshiger's sister and his wife and his mom, who all talked to me um, about what happened to him. Um, because it's a complete mystery. You know, as incredible as it is that Billy Levine just killed his best friend in his living room, uh, you know, and then wasn't even arrested for it. It's also deeply mysterious why he did that because there's no apparent motive for it. It makes no sense. I mean, they were coming back from Disneyland with their daughters. Their daughters were both girls were present when the murder happened. Um, they were driving back from Disneyland um, after having been there, and you know, both of them were drinking and, and, and taking drugs out of sight, supposedly of the girls. Um, and they got in some kind of argument on the way back. No one knows over what. They were both wigging out, paranoid, uh, strung out. Um, and then when they got back to the house, uh, Mark Leshiker apparently started working on the engine of the car. They're trying to dis- disassemble the engine of the car for some reason. And these details are very spotty, um, but you know they found the car engine partially disassembled. Um, and it, 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 he was apparently having some kind of paranoid uh, break. Uh, I don't know exactly what you know caused him to do that. But Billy grabbed the girls and, and went inside and then locked the door. And then um, Mark Leshiker was pounding on the door, demanding to be let in. His daughter, who was uh, five years old, I believe, heard him calling, came to the door. And because, of course, you know, it, when you're a child that age, you, you do what your parents tell you. So she came to the door and opened, uh, you know, opened it up so her father could come in. And then, um, you know, the, it, it's very hard to say exactly what happened after that. But, but Levine definitely, you know, shot and killed him uh, within a few moments of him stepping foot inside the house. Um, it, it becomes hard to talk about at this point because the, the details just come from the girls that have been, you know, I didn't interview the girls, but they, I interviewed uh, her, her mom and her grandma uh, who told me, you know, who, who have heard the story from her. And so, you know, she says that her daddy was just walking towards Uncle Billy is what she called him. And she said Uncle Billy started shooting him. And my daddy fell down and Uncle Billy stood over him and kept shooting him. Um, and then, you know, the, the details, the strange details just keep piling up because although Leshiger was unarmed, he normally was, or he normally, you know, like a lot of these guys, he normally had a concealed carry. So that's question number one. Why was he not armed at that moment? Why did Levine kill him if he wasn't armed? And then Levine told the police that he had, came at him with a screwdriver, yet there was no screwdriver to be found anywhere near the body. Um, so he didn't even attempt to like come up with a believable story. It, it, the whole thing makes absolutely no sense. There's no motive. The story makes no sense um, from any different angle. And then finally, this isn't in the piece, but because uh, it's not in the piece simply because I didn't know what to do with it. It's just so bizarre that it would have taken so much explanation and it adds nothing. So we just left it out. But Leshiker, Leshiker's weapon was found in the house. It was, a, it was some kind of sidearm. I don't know exactly what. But it was disassembled on the kitchen counter. So it's just another detail that makes absolutely no sense. Because Levine comes up with this cockamamie self-defense story after, after it happens. But doesn't try to incorporate the weapon that Leshiker did have with him. Instead, he says he came with a screwdriver, which he didn't have with him. The fact so, that the cops didn't even charge him, didn't arrest him, like it sounded like there's like, ah, yeah, justifiable and let him go. That I hope I'm not over, oversimplifying it, but like that's just, I, I, I don't even think you would get that much leeway with cops. That's the thing that blows my mind. And and I will, uh, you know, the the update at the very bottom is is uh, something that really stood out to me where. You know, uh, there's a contact from special uh, Army Special Operations Command spokesperson. So I assume you talked to somebody. Somebody from PAO finally reached out to you. 
Uh, but it's the the quote is due to his length of service, Master Sergeant Levine was entitled to a variety of due process protections, appropriate adverse effect, uh, actions, which was previously initiated in response to substantiated misconduct, was being finalized at the time of Master Sergeant Levine's death. And and there was he was finally getting charged with something, but then died. Yeah, well, so they say. Right. Uh, but there's nothing to substantiate that. Um, and these are guys who believe that they have the right to lie to the public and to the press for national security purposes. Uh, in fact, they see that as their job. But another thing that's not in the piece is that Levine, because it's a 9,000 word article, there was just other stuff to include. And just some of it, just we just couldn't make sense of it. Um, but Levine, after he had killed Leshiker, the first person he called was his, um, was his uh, uh, sergeant major, his direct supervisor in Delta Force. I didn't name him on the piece in the piece because I was asked not to. However, uh, Jack Murphy does name him in his podcast. So if you're really that curious, you can go listen to it. Um, so Levine calls up his, his direct line supervisor on Delta, tells him that Leshiker committed suicide. So this guy, the, the Delta Force Sergeant Major, hops in his truck and starts hauling ass across Fayetteville to come reach the location um, and is the first person to arrive uh, on the scene, which is interesting. And then he takes control of Mark Leshiker's cell phone. Uh, again, this isn't in the piece either. And he, it, he holds on to Leshiker's phone for three days. Um, now, I don't know why he would have done that, but it's awful suspicious. You know what this really reminds me of? And I'm sorry to, to jump in, man. What this really reminds me of is the way that, I mean, I, people who are longtime listeners of the show know that I, I get very, very frustrated when describing my experiences with, with the, the elite units just because of the, the, the constant shit that we would, would have to mop up. And then how unfair it was, you know, them popping in, fucking doing these, these midnight raids and, and murdering 80 year old men in their sleep. And then be like, oh, yeah, we found a grenade somehow. Surely this guy was going to kill us. You know, like, but this sounds like what, like that. This sounds like what you do if an op went wrong and you needed to fucking scrub it before, you know, CID got involved. That's a great point. That's, it's exactly what it's like. Um, because it's just amazing how many people, right before they get killed by, you know, a, a squad of tier one guys, you know, were reaching for a weapon. Didn't actually fire a weapon, you know, didn't assault them, didn't come at them, but were reaching inside their jacket or something like that. And, you know, we see that also as well with law enforcement. I mean, again, you know, I, I'm not the first person to go criticize calling these guys, you know, murders and stuff like that. I put all the fault with the, I mean, that's what they're trained to do is kill, kick down doors and kill. And, and I put more of the fault with, you know, with political leadership and so forth, like the wars, if the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan were for a good purpose, we would be a lot less judgmental of their actions. But anyway, to bring it back to the point with with uh, Levine, you know, so after his sergeant major arrives at the scene, he calls the cops on himself. Um, and I have the investigator's report, uh, or excuse me, the uh, deputy who was the first to arrive. You know, he describes it because he's not in on it afterwards, in on whatever sort of cover up they did afterwards. Yeah. Because the Fayetteville police and the Cumberland County Sheriff's Department are mob deep. They don't give a fuck. They are 100% in the bag for the, for the command over there at Fort Bragg. Um, they don't owe the public any explanation for their actions and, and their, and their uh, I, think, I think, viewpoint. Um, and they don't even try to make it look like it's uh, you know, a real investigation. Because this deputy, who, who, again, I said, is not in on it. He doesn't even know, he doesn't know Billy Levine from Adam. He, you know, he just writes in his report, you know, that I came there and the suspect came outside. You know, I was shouting at him to turn around, put his hands against the wall, handcuffs him, throws him in the back of the car. You know, writes the report and says this is a homicide, and there's one suspect, Billy Levine. He doesn't know, like, again, doesn't know who he is, and so he transports him down to the Cumberland County Sheriff's Department. And then I think, uh, according to Mark Lester's wife and uh, some other people, that because people were coming to the scene, um, family members and so forth were, were arriving. Again, this took place immediately after a big family vacation at Disney World or Disneyland. So there's a bunch, a bunch of family members in town. So they, they take him to the police station, or excuse me, the sheriff's uh, sheriff's headquarters, not to the jail, but to the sheriff's headquarters in downtown Fayetteville. And um, he's almost instantly released. Uh, he's never placed under arrest. He's never read his Miranda rights. Um, three trucks full of Delta Force operators showed up at the jail, uh, excuse me, at the headquarters, um, because he wasn't taken to jail, and, uh, and just take him home. And that's it. 
case closed, justifiable homicide. That's absolutely unbelievable. That's insane, but also it's not surprising at all. It's just, like, I mean, to is- me, it's just, it's just, it's, that is 100%. Like I'll I'll give you a quick anecdote. I wasn't on this mission. A friend of mine went along because he knew how to operate um, the bat hide, the biometric camera, and they did a battlefield handover with um, with Task Force Three Seven Three, which I think at that point it wasn't Rangers. It was it was SEALs. It wasn't SEAL Team Six, but it was another SEAL unit. And he very obviously saw a situation where they had a body where a guy had been shot with his hands behind his head in a kneeling position and then dragged to another part of the room. And they just like very like desultorily put a, a, a vest with um, magazines, like not even a weapon, just like uh, like an equipment vest with magazines inside the room. Like, yeah, you had that assessed as a threat, you know, enemy KIA. And my friend was like, like, I'm not a cop, but this is pretty fucking obvious what you guys did. And yeah. that that to me is what this sounds. I mean, that, that's just ringing so many bells. And like, obviously, you know, okay, you know, that's we have we all have a tendency to to sort of like correlate our own experiences when when relating these things. But I just feel like if that's the culture and you operate with impunity, and I mean, much like the drug stuff, which to me, I mean, you know, I've heard some stories from my soldiers after we got out of the military about some of the shit that was going on with people taking coke and taking ecstasy and stuff, never out in the open, but like it was happening. We had soldiers get rolled up for smoking hash in Afghanistan, that kind of a thing. But the level of impunity being described in this piece that people are very open about, like that same impunity, uh, you know, of just of just sort of I mean, there's no one who's actually going to call you on it. It seems like it, to me, it's not like I think the, 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 the one potential sort of civilian interpretation could be like, damn, this unit really got out of hand. And the other part of it is like, well, this is just how they are downrange, too. Well, we've all been there. It's funny. I've never even thought about this comparison. I, I think it's, you know, you're, you're dead on bringing this up, you know, to talk about how they, they just treated it like a bad shoot where they quickly cover it up. But um, I think we've all been there. If, if, you know, those of us who have been downrange. I mean, I was on a convoy uh, coming back from um, uh, Baghdad uh, to Balad. I think we were passing through Taji. And a guy in my unit, you know, he was one of these guys, if you had asked us beforehand, if you had pulled the whole platoon, like who's most likely to go off and kill somebody for no reason, it would have been this guy, whose name I won't mention, but he was the E5. And um, he lit up, a, he lit up a little, um, a little Toyota pickup that was, I don't know what it was doing. I didn't see it. I just heard the 50 cal go off Yep. and then turn around and, 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 the, and the pickup is down on one wheel and smoking from the engine bubbling and stuff. Um, and it was totally unjustified the, the, what he did. And, um, it turned out it was a woman and her kid, like a five-year-old okay. boy was in the front seat. And which is unusual because oftentimes you wouldn't see a Rocky woman, a Rocky woman driving alone for whatever reason, in this case she was. Um, and some of us complain, I, I don't think I was one of the ones that it was a big convoy. There's probably 70 uh, personnel on it. Tons of stuff was going on. This was an 04 and there's like shit happening right and left. But um, some of us in the, in the unit uh, went and complained on this guy um, and said, you know, that shoot was bad. Some of the guys that had eyes on it went and complained. Um, I was one of the ones that was called to go testify because a JAG showed up, um, and, you know, wanted to interview everyone that's on the convoy. I told him what I knew just truthfully. I was like, yeah, I didn't see it. I heard it. And I don't see, you know, he asked me, was the, was the truck a threat? And I, you know, I said, I don't see how it could have been because it was probably 70, 75 yards away. Yeah. Um, and, um, and that, that was all I, I didn't think about it much after that. I thought he was, I thought this guy was screwed. I thought they were going to, you know, at a minimum, he's going to be busted down, if not arrested um, by CID. Um, and then, you know, months went by and then I heard that they had found weapons and enemy uniforms in the truck. This was just scuttled about passing through sure, because yeah. we were detached here, detached there. So it took a while for the, for the word to trickle back to me. But when I heard that story, you know, that, that they had found weapons and enemy uniforms in the truck. It, it just, it was a very formative experience. I was probably 19 years old. I, and I just realized, wow, they, these, it wasn't just my unit. Cause I could have totally seen my commander and first sergeant do something like that. Yeah. For sure. But to see these guys who were majors and Lieutenant colonels from JAG come down and interview everyone and then write a report. That's that level of like, just full of shit. It was it was very eye opening. I would say I realized, wow, they just totally covered that up. Because what does that even mean? Enemy uniforms? Yeah, but right there, the 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 Taliban chevrons or something like that. What does that even mean? <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I mean that the yeah, I, I, I there was a National Guard unit um, 
at that uh, shared the base. I, I, I wound up uh, working at a, a coordination center uh, for a period of time where we worked with the Afghan provincial headquarters and there was an American, small American fob attached to us that had a unit from the Georgia National Guard, I think. And same sort of thing. A guy just, just shot a kid off a bicycle with a 240 and then claimed he was actually in the clearing pit and it was a misfire or something. And, and, and people were like, but like, how in the fuck would that even be possible? You, you, you are not that stupid to not point the weapon at the clearing barrel when you're clearing it. So how did you like, but they just sent him home, no charges, you know, sent him home early. And it's like, that was a very, yeah, you know, they, they, they pay that kid's family like $1,200 and call it a day. And it's like, to me, if that's what a regular unit's operating at, then my experience, what I've saw of units, you know, you'd go on ops with, you go on, on, on air assaults with a couple of SEALs or a SEAL team would be along and they'd all have AKs as well as their actual weapons because just in case they needed to drop one. And then that was just kind of treated as a given, you know, knowing, knowing that, it doesn't surprise me that that's just, I mean, but, but there is that initial shock, like sort of the first time you, 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 you spray in a joint, the, the idea that like, oh, they do this in America too. They do this back home too. And I, I realize it's speculation, obviously, but like when I look at that, it's like, that's just, I mean, there's a bunch of other stuff in this story about Fort Bragg. And I mean, I, I even was in that unit the, the very temporarily before I outprocessed Bragg, like where that kid was found in the barracks. I know the company in question, but to me, like the bigger picture at Bragg is, is a crazy one. But like, if this doesn't even rattle anybody's heads, I, I just, you know, as well as I do, they're not going to, they're not going to care about random regular unit soldiers. Yeah, definitely. But yeah. My unit as well was conventional, not special forces. Have you all read the Australian war, war crimes report? Yeah, I haven't read the whole report, but I've read a summary of it. And I mean, if they were ever to do something like that, because I think they spent four years and interviewed like hundreds of people. Uh, and also traveled to Afghanistan and dealing with a very limited AO with where the Australian army was yeah. located. Um, but they produced a comprehensive report that I, and the, the, the net result of it was that they ended up recommending 19, if I'm not mistaken, Australian soldiers to the uh, Australian federal police for murder charges. Um, now, if they ever did anything like that, an investigation of that thorough, you know, into, into the United States, uh, you know, some of the United States units, let's just say JSOC, um, it's just imagine what they would come up with. I mean, it, 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 it makes the, the blood run cold, but that, that isn't to paint in too broad a brush, you know, a little, so let me just slip a co- little caveat in, in here. You know, I don't think that all operators are like this. Um, just like and everyone in my unit wasn't like this guy that, you know, murdered that woman and her kid. We were really pissed off. Oh, another thing I should mention, but although we, I think it's important, uh, a context or let's say, um, you know, just to complicate it a little bit is that although the command covered that guy, covered that guy's, uh, crime up afterwards, he was a pariah in the unit and no one wanted to look him in the face or talk to him. Um, because we all knew what he had done. Um, so I don't know if to some extent that also goes on in, in units like, you know, Delta Force. I, I really don't know. I can't speculate. Well, um, there's, I'm sure there's a difference between you killed a random brown person overseas versus you killed one of us. Um, and, and you lied about it and we know you lied about it. And, and you know, to, to speak on your um, all special forces, people aren't like this. I mean, maybe not, but it's kind of the, the idea of... Uh, bad cops versus good cops. If the good cop sees the bad cop doing bad cop stuff and doesn't say anything, that's a bad cop. Like same thing with special forces. Those three truckloads of Delta force guys that showed up to say, no, we're going to take them home and you're not going to do anything about it. All those people should probably be brought up on charges for shit, for hampering investigation or, or, or whatever, or something like that. Well, just imagine how angry Leshiker's family. will. I mean, I interviewed his mom uh, multiple times she, you know, she actually used to be a policewoman in, uh, you know, a number of small towns. And she was incredibly um, up in arms about all of this and did everything that she could, uh, writing letters to everyone that she could, wrote letters to the head of CID, wrote letters to the command of Fort Bragg, wrote letters to CNN, Dateline, et cetera, trying to get him interested. And, in, you know, the fact that her son, who, you know, as you say, a different standard applies to, to, to people with brown skin um, who are Muslim in foreign countries. Versus her son, you know, who is a decorated Green Beret, uh, sergeant first class, and it's just it's just straight up killed even when he was unarmed, and they didn't do anything about it. Didn't even place the guy under arrest. But then, you know, just a few months later, 
I think it was six months later, Billy Levine was arrested on uh, charges of manufacturing, or excuse me, he was maintaining a dwelling place or a vehicle to manufacture controlled substance was the charge. Yeah. N- Nate and I are Midwesterners. We know what that means. <laughs> um, yeah, it was, it was, yeah. He was arrested with, I mean, I'm just trying to, I mean, you can imagine, it, I'm just picturing, it was at the same house where he had killed Mark Lesherger. So he continued to, to live there, even though he had killed his best friend in the living room, uh, which is pretty dark in my opinion. Um, but he sank even deeper and spiraled into, because by all accounts, he was very broken up about, for whatever reason caused him to do that, he was very broken up about it afterwards. You know, I talked to his dad who said that he was just gone after that, you know, um, staring off into space. Um, you, had snap, you had to snap your fingers in front of his eyes to get him to pay attention to you. And his drug use just was completely out of control from, from then on out. Um, he was, you know, I met a woman who said that she had done heroin, crystal methamphetamine, you name it with him. He's arrested in possession of, um, you know, it's incredible to read like the arrest report. It's just this arsenal of weapons that he's got in, in his living room. Um, everything from, you know, sawed off shotgun. I don't even know what it was. I don't have it in front of me, but it's five different weapons he had five different firearms that he had and also a crossbow, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and he, the charges initially were manufacturing, you know, man, maintaining a, a dwelling place to manufacture a controlled substance, harboring an escapee. And then of course, possession of cocaine, possession of crack cocaine, possession of drug paraphernalia. Once again, charges instantly dropped, disappeared, gone. Can't find any record of them in the North Carolina um, state system. So, and that's six months after he killed somebody wasn't charged the, the, the thing that 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 you know you you mentioned in this piece that by your count and from what you've done and it seemed very scrupulous from what i could tell that something like 44 soldiers have died at fort bragg and you made the point that like of the units deployed from bragg that were deployed to combat like three people had died and you made the point you know the very very sort of with caveats that that's not to say that it's more dangerous to be at Bragg, but like that's that's almost double the amount of people who died at Fort Hood, and people at least are aware of the fact that Hood's got a problem. Mm-hmm. And how that happens, how one turns into a big media narrative and the other doesn't, I'm not quite sure. Well, the the Fort Hood um, was also couched in sexual harassment, sexual Absolutely. assault. Yeah. This is special forces guys are killing each other, and also you know as you've been pointing out. SF Delta guys, nothing, nothing becomes permanent when they do something wrong. Like there's not a record, there's not a paper trail or anything like that. Vanessa Guillon was murdered and there is a paper trail because they're not, they don't have the, you know, as you say in your, in your note at the end, they don't have the special, you know, uh, protections that, that come with this. So it's very easy, you know, Fort Hood to say, yeah, Fort Hood, there's a problem. There's all these things because it's, you know, happening throughout the entire base, but this is, this is something that is contained to a group that is already very secretive, very internal themselves. They don't, you know, they, they, they're not really like, I've never met anybody in Delta. I've barely met any special forces guys. I've done two deployments. I've been in for 20 years. Um, you know, so, so there's, there, there's absolutely a division in the, uh, the soldier, like the, the level of soldier that somebody can be, and then also the protections they get. So it, it absolutely makes sense that, you know, a uh, Vanessa Guillon is what kicked off uh, a big thing at Hood, and this is just quiet murder. Like I didn't know any of this was happening until I read your until I read your story. Like because it gets covered up, and then you know, you say forty something people have died there. How many of those were even just suicides? You know, how many? Twenty one. Yeah, like half of them are people. Yeah, half of them are people offering themselves in. And and there's no there's just no conversation around that. And you know, suicide absolutely comes from post-traumatic stress disorder mixed with uh, drinking too much, mixed with doing cocaine, mixed with everything else that these guys are doing. Of course, there's going to be suicides. Of course, there's going to be these problems. But it just seems Bragg was the special forces community is better at keeping a lid on it because, you know, it's kind of a we take care of our own, but they don't. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Fort Hood is, you know, as you all know, it's, a you know, you you have a bunch of 19-year-old and 20-year-old E3s and E4s who are in transport, uh, you know, units uh, and, and other things like that. Um, Fayetteville and Fort Bragg are very different because it's the uh, it's the home of the Airborne Corps, and all the units there, even the conventional units, are airborne units. So it's much more, heav- much more heavily male, almost exclusively male. 
uh, the, the, the soldiers that assigned to those units. Um, and, and besides that, they are surrounded by, you know, much of a culture that I think, like you said, they're much more used to having everything be secret. And when things do go wrong, then the commands, they're used to having the command swoop in and cover it up, paper, paper it over. And as far as I can tell, CID's whole job is just to cover up crimes. And I say that advisedly because even the, um, you know, the PAOs that I would talk to, the, 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 the spokesman for these various units, off the record would have very disparaging things to say about CID. Uh, CID hadn't solved a single one of these crimes. I mean, that's a pretty piss poor record. Okay? When you have do- literally dozens of homicides, or excuse me, dozens of deaths, um, you know, so was scores of deaths uh, and, and, and several very high profile, violent, bizarre homicides where people are getting beheaded, where people are turning up dead in the woods. And for them not to be able to solve a single one, that's, I mean, that's not how a, a police force is supposed to work. Um, and the fact that they don't, they, they think they have no obligation to even disclose like basic details. You can't get a single detail about like, for example, the crime scene where Billy Levine turned up. You can't get any details about that. As far as, um, you know, the other guy, um, Enrique Roman Martinez, um, I, you know, they insinuated to me off the record that he, that he, his exact words were, you know, the PAO's exact words were, you know, you should look into this guy's background and see why he really joined the army. Um, talking about his like drug use and so forth. And, the, the insinuation that I got there, I found it to be a very highly racialized um, insinuation that he was making about this guy. And it's like, well, even if he was dealing drugs in the barracks, it's like, does he deserve to be beheaded? You say, yeah, that's the punishment for dealing drugs in the barracks isn't you get your head cut off while camping. And what the fuck is up with that anyway? Yeah, sorry to interrupt. No, you. it's fine. No, I was interrupting you, man. I was just thinking, but I, I wanted to drop a couple of things in here too, because this has jogged some memories. Like, I think I told Francis this that you know so I mean I I I wasn't I wasn't depressed about getting out of SF I didn't want to be in anymore the culture I just wasn't for me I didn't want to stay in the army I knew it was time to get out so I got out but like the unit that you get sent to when you are on your way out of the Q course is a, is a holding company basically that you can be there I was there for like a month but you could be there some guys were there pending med boards for years and I remember one day I had to go in and you know a lot of people are depressed because this is the thing they joined the army to do they enlisted as 18 x-rays or whatever and like they they didn't make it something happened i went in one day to fill out some paperwork in the company cp and i mean i was a captain so like i think i was treated a little bit differently so they just let me in like when they normally would make soldiers wait outside and i just happened to notice among all the stuff they had in the company cp was like a little joke sign they had made for themselves like i can't remember the name of the company but it was like join the x company frg and like it was a picture of the grim reaper and from what I could tell, that was kind of making light of how many people commit suicide in their company. Yikes. And it's like, this was in 2013, but you know, uh, I knew someone in Fayetteville through a friend who um, her, uh, her husband had committed suicide and he it would, had very obviously intentionally committed suicide, but the unit uh, did an investigation, like a line of duty investigation and determined that he didn't know the gun was loaded when he put it to his head after having already fired it once into the ground. Um, and his wife wound up getting an insurance payout for it. And I'm not saying that those are like related to the stuff that you were describing, but it did seem to me like no one, no one in the right mind could look at that situation where that guy committed suicide and be like, oh, he didn't know the gun was loaded. He fired the gun to scare his wife and then put a gun to his head and killed himself. Like he knew it was loaded, but they, they, they decided like, well, we don't want to really technically call this a suicide. You know, he was a little jumpy. It was, it was a mistake. And I, it felt to me like, like there's so many ways to get in bad trouble at Bragg and that there was this culture of kind of like, you know, yeah, you, you know, you, you show up at formation, but what happens after hours, anything goes. And so that's my speculation, obviously, from, you know, being stationed there for a little over a year. But it does when you when you're talking about like the sort of underbelly of this in this piece, all of that rang true. Well, in addition to the suicides, which are off the charts over there at Bragg, um, there was a, a sort of, I guess, uh, miscellaneous category, I would say, uh, which was folks that have been found unresponsive. And, the, and I don't know exactly what the army, I mean, obviously they mean dead, but, um, you know, I found at least, uh, I want to say at least four cases where someone was just found unresponsive in their bunk. And we're talking about, you know, healthy young men who are, you know, who are probably 20 to 24 years old in, in all of these cases, 19 to 24. 
I think was the age range for these folks who found it unresponsive. It's like, well, what is that, what does that mean? They wouldn't answer any questions about that. How does someone just die in their sleep when you're, when you're 20 years old? Um, and how do you have no investigation and no details? One of them, Caleb Smither, uh, was apparently found, you know, when he was discovered unresponsive in his bunk, he was so decomposed that he couldn't have an open casket funeral, his mom told me. Yeah. And how how does how does a soldier like go how missing. is there nobody keeping keeping track of that person? Yeah, like I ha, have me miss a formation and watch a sergeant come kick my door. Yeah. In. Well, let's not forget this all happened during COVID. So it was uh, a strange time, um, for sure. And, you know, substance abuse across the country, I think, skyrocketed during COVID. So did uh, suicide, sort of violent crime. So I don't think that the Army is immune to any of those forces. But the fact that the military won't say anything, any details about any of these deaths, I think is the, is the real issue. Is the real issue here. They won't say anything about the people that were discovered unresponsive, um, you know, I would, um, if I, again, rank speculation, absolutely no uh, basis to believe this except for, you know, just the circumstantial stuff. But it, th- those, I would guess, would be drug overdoses. You know, when you're, when you're in you're North Carolina, you're, and especially everything else I learned about, you know, what's going on at Fort Bragg, I would guess that, you know, maybe those people were taking fentanyl or something. I have no idea. Really, I don't know. Um, but to just die in your sleep when you're 20 years old and for the army to say nothing about it afterwards. And it's not that they won't say anything to the public. They won't tell anything to the families. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we had a soldier in my brigade die and they thought it was like he drank himself to death, but it turned out that he uh, was right when he came back from deployment that he had just had some kind of congenital heart problem. And they made sure everyone fucking knew that. Like they made sure they're like, like, listen, we have a drinking problem at Fort Richardson, Alaska, but like this soldier did not commit suicide. The soldier did not, you know, die of an alcohol overdose. This was just a fluke. And like, so the idea of them not telling even the families, that's just, it's just, it's just very strange to me. And I mean, I'm not surprised, um, but put it this way. My, I, I was under the impression that the people at um, 25th Infantry were pretty happy with my brigade commander's performance for our deployment to Afghanistan, despite the fact that we were the unit that Bo Bergdahl walked off from. Um, he was worried. Like, the, the level of incredible scrutiny they put on us about people ha- fucking around with alcohol post-deployment gave me the impression that he was worried for his own career because of DUIs and a single soldier dying. And like, yeah, losing a soldier for no reason is, is, a, is a very, very unfortunate thing. But like, the notion that at, at you know, between 18th Airborne Corps and USASOC and you know, uh, what's it called? The Army Forces Command, losing 44 people like that over, and, and, and they're not like upending the entire fucking place. Like it completely blows my mind. And I, 40, 44 is just the ones I was able to count. Yeah. Like that, that is, that is shocking. They, w- they won't say how many soldiers have died in 2020 who are on active duty, which is really strange because the military will typically, that's the one thing they will disclose yeah. is like, even when that CIA officer got uh, got killed in Somalia, you know, we we know the fact that he was a CIA officer and he was killed. That's like usually the bare minimum. Yep. They won't even say how many soldiers have died on Fort Bragg in 2020. And I, you know, God knows I asked him many, many times. Um, but, you know, you mentioned Bo Bergdahl and, uh, you know, one of the cases that I definitely want to point uh, point out that, that I featured in the article was the case of Keith Lewis who apparently, I don't know if, I think you just said the 25th Infantry, I don't know if he was also in the 25th Infantry or what unit exactly it was, but he at least told his family that he had been in the same unit as Bo Bergdahl, Um, and um, he had, you know, he had done a a, a deployment to Afghanistan, so I don't know if you know him or if you knew who he was or or if that rang any bells, but um, I thought his case was a very important one because he had gotten into, so he came back from Afghanistan, according to his mom, with PTSD and TBI and a completely changed person um, and developed a severe drinking problem and was also heavily into uh, steroids. He wasn't in special war. I don't think he was SF qualified, but he was a, a combat medic who was attached to the first SF command. Um, and he had a very tumultuous marriage with a woman named Sarah Lewis, um, uh, whose family I interviewed. Um, and um, in 2016, he was drunk. He started pushing Sarah around. He caused her to fall and hit her head. You know, he assaulted her. 
and uh, he then got into an armed standoff with the Fayetteville police in which he had a gun in his mouth and was threatening to kill himself and was on the phone with his mom, who, who finally succeeded in talking him down. And uh, after, after that happened, the military did nothing. He remained in his unit. He remained at the same rank. He remained living with his wife uh, in the uh, off-post off housing. And in 2020, you know, during, in December 2020, according to Sarah's mom, uh, she called his unit command, the, the commander of the 1st Special Forces uh, Command, uh, and um, told them that she was af- afraid for her safety, that her husband was drinking heavily, that he was using steroids, and that she was afraid for her safety and the safety of her baby. That was on December 11th, according to her, according to her mom. They didn't do anything. Eleven days later, he killed her, um, and he he was drunk at the time. She called the cops, and told them that, that that he was drunk and wouldn't let her hold the baby. Um, and then she ran to a neighbor's house. He followed her out and just dumped a, a magazine, uh, you know, at her at the totaled the neighbor's car. He fired fired so many rounds. She tried to hide behind the neighbor's car. He fired so many rounds. This is in like a suburban cul-de-sac in Fayetteville. Yeah. It was the neighbor's car, and then um, the police respond to the scene. By the way, as he did this, he was this is this is so dark. But he was holding his three year old daughter on his hip. Fucking Christ! His daughter on in his in his arms as he as he was murdering his wife with, with, with his firearm. And his, his the, very his very pregnant wife, very pregnant, nine months pregnant. She actually this is just incredibly gruesome and it's tragic. Uh, it, but she actually gave birth while she was being murdered, you know, and the, the child also uh, didn't survive. I mean, this is the worst, like, type of um, most gruesome murder homicide you can possibly imagine. And um, because then he then killed himself, um, right? And, you know, as the police were responding to the scene. Um, but the, I think that there was a missed opportunity there where the command could have done something about it. And just com- chose to completely ignore it, and it shows that it has real consequences. You know, when they when they do absolutely nothing. And by the way, it just goes further than that. It goes beyond that. Like the the army's refusal to talk, refusal to give any details, refusal to um, help people understand what's going on, continued even after the, the incident and after he had died. Because I also interviewed Keith Lewis's mom, uh, who's up in Alaska, who. Um, has his body in cold storage and hasn't even buried him. This is three months after this happened. This happened in December, 2020. I interviewed her in April. And um, at that time, or maybe it was late March at that time, she still had his body in cold storage because she is trying to get his medical records from the army because she believes that he had been one diagnosed with PTSD, uh, two diagnosed with TBI and three was medicated on uh, for PTSD by the military. Um, and they won't give her anything. They won't give her his medical records. They won't answer any questions. They have never spoken to her or talked to her. Um, and even though she calls them, she said every single day, she says she called Fort Bragg's command. And she, she refuses to have his body buried because she thinks that she, she is, you know, horrified by what her son did, that he murdered his wife and, 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 and unborn child, nine months unborn child. Um, and wants to sort of, I don't want to say clear his name, but just show that like, you know, something was wrong with his brain. He wasn't in his right mind yeah. and they, won't, they won't cooperate at all. That is, I didn't know him. I, I was racking my brain the entire time you were telling that story because I, I was wondering, the only thing I would say is that it's possible that, you know, he was in the same unit, but I mean, I may not have encountered a guy in my battalion. And obviously if he was just in the same brigade as me, then I wouldn't, there's no way I would have known him, but like that doesn't surprise i mean i don't say it doesn't surprise me it's just that you know i know we, we were going a little long we'll have to close this out but like I, I when we first came back from from afghanistan there was a soldier who um from the cav unit as part of our brigade murdered his wife and then committed suicide and um you know it's another one of the situations where it's like people kind of people in the unit knew that something was not good with this kid and but he lived off post and they're like well you know out of sight out of mind and then this happened Um, but I guess to me, the thing that makes it so shocking is what you've just described that it seemed like this was a one of many and B, there were so many opportunities where there were just enormous red flags, 
in this case, in the case of uh, Mark Leshiker, um and Billy Levine, like all these things, there were so many warning signs. And it feels like, I don't know, I, something between paranoia and contempt. I don't know. But it's the, like, like, like just talking to you over the course of the last hour and change, like I am, I am genuinely floored by this stuff. And, and this is what we do. I mean, we, re, we do this show. We talk about the stuff. We're both pretty candid about the bad stuff that we saw when we were deployed and when we were in service. Like, it's unbelievable. Oh, you know, I forgot to mention the, uh, the Keith Lewis case because, yeah, I was also totally floored by that, that they didn't take any action against uh, Keith Lewis um, after he got in a, literally an armed standoff with the police. You don't even get busted down a rank. But um, importantly, I should mention, the phone call that Sarah allegedly made uh, on December 11th to the commander of the first special forces command uh, was obviously with her cell phone. Yeah. And you should be able to, it should be easy to verify, you know, of course I asked, you know, the, 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 that unit, if they had in fact received that call, they didn't deny it. Um, but they said, you know, we haven't been able to substantiate that. Well, it should be really easy to substantiate, uh, with Sarah Lewis's cell phone. So you could subpoena but, the records. Like every month they have the list in your cell phone bill of the calls you made. Right. You could also get it from that third party provider from AT&T or what have you, whatever. It was, and I don't know what it was. But the Fayetteville police seized her phone and surprise, they won't give it back. They're in on it. The Fayetteville police are just the junior partners to the military cover-ups. I, I have to say as somebody who, who did seek, you know, uh, counseling for, for PTSD that it's, it's not surprising to me because, you know, when, I mean, it, it's horrifying, like to the, to the degree that it went to, but it's not surprising to me that these things get, you know, crimes like this will get covered up because one, as we've said, sometimes Delta doesn't select anybody. It's hard to get into special forces. These are people who the, the government has spent a lot of money on and a team leader, like if I'm the team leader of these guys, I know them. I don't want to lose somebody who I know can operate just because they went off the deep end at one point. And the, the generals and the high-ranking people of the army will all tell you that it's perfectly okay to go to counseling. It's perfectly okay to do all of these things. And, and, and it is, and you should, but also there's still always going to be a culture, you know, even amongst the, even amongst us normies, us normal soldiers, you know, uh, those of us who are the Pogues or just the regular 11 Bravos, there's always going to be a, oh, you're going to counseling? Ooh, what's wrong with you? I mean, you more than that, crazy? Francis, you you, shoot the depending on, your, um, on what kind of unit you're in, if you get prescribed medication from a psychiatrist, you can be dumped from training or you can actually you can, you can lose uh, your ability to do certain things. Like if you're, say, for example, you were on a Halo team or on a dive team, you might literally not be allowed to do your job. So guys will... T- yeah. T- I mean, tell, tell, us, tell an infantry soldier who says, oh, I, I've been having suicidal ideations. And then, and then, you know, the psychiatrist or the command says, we have to take away all of your guns. That's, you might as well fucking cut their dicks off, you know, like at least to them, at least, you know, to, to sure. that mentality. Well, so, I mean, and, and I mean, and, and it's funny though, you should mention this too, because I mean, I had a soldier who uh, was in a domestic violence situation where, I mean, ultimately it came down to, um, he wound up being, it's a fucked up situation. I don't want to get into details because it's, 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 it was like a back and forth thing where like his wife would attack him, his, he would attack his wife, that kind of a thing. Um, but he was the armor and he couldn't be the armor anymore because he'd gotten hit with a, whatever the order is, like a domestic violence order. He couldn't be around any guns. And it's like, he couldn't be an armor anymore. And you know, it's, so it's like, there is obviously a career advantage to them not reporting this. And one detail that just collected, connected in my mindset that I feel like is, is uh, maybe another point here is that you know, Francis, you mentioned like, yeah, special forces guys. And my first thought was like, yeah, but like, you know, these guys weren't all these guys weren't special forces, but the sustainers in special forces units are part of that culture of their, you know, they might be wearing red hats and not green hats, but like, they're still part of that sort of it's us versus the world kind of shit. And, you know, you get a lot of young specialist sergeants who've either not been in units before or only been in one unit. And they're, they suddenly are around, you know, the frat, if you will. And th- that culture, the guy, the guy that you, um, whose name escapes me, but, uh, who, who wound up dead, uh, with, um, Billy Levine, um, you said he was, he was like, he was like the PBO for a group or whatever. Like, he, he, you know, same thing with the guy you said he was the, uh, uh, combat medic and he was assigned to a special forces unit, but not like a, not an 18 Delta. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, 
it's 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 wild to me. Yeah, and we, you know, there's a lot of on uh, Dumas's LinkedIn is still up, and you know, in his sort of job description, he talked about overseeing um, the op fund, and the guy who the Green Beret who wrote me from prison um, told me a lot about how they steal from the op fund, and how they paper it over with false receipts, and there are numerous cases uh, of uh, you know people getting caught stealing uh, large amounts of cash. It's like, but that that is not surprising at all. I mean. The amount of cash that I, we, I think people don't realize that that bricks of cash, just like weapons and firearms, are part of you know what they carry in in the rucksack over to to these deployments because that's what you use to pay off local security forces, you use to pay informants and so forth. And it's very easy for that stuff to go missing. And there's been countless cases of it. I mean, I think they did an audit at some point and found that in the early days of the Iraq War, I don't know how many billions of dollars of uh, just straight up cash just went missing. I'm sure pallets, pallets of cash went missing. Like they, we had to palletize, you know, whatever the local currency was, and then it would just go away and there'd be nobody, nobody signed for it. Nobody knows what happened to it. Well, I think there's a kind of a, an assumption sort of running through this whole conversation or not necessarily an assumption any of us are making, but you know, some folks might be tempted to assume that like maybe if everyone just sort of followed the rules, if there was greater accountability, if there was more honesty, better leadership, et cetera, and all these problems would go away and, and, and we could deal with it. But I don't, I don't share that point of view. I, I think that we're stuck with these kind of problems, with these kind of um, issues. As a result, it's just part of the massive fallout that's going to continue for the rest of our lives um, from the uh, wars in Iraq. And more or less, to, to not hopefully be too crass about it, but like, you go fight an illegal war, what's a little more additional crime? That's right. That's right. And I hate to say it that way, um, you know. Yeah, I mean, shit, between the three of us, there's probably, you know, easily 30 odd years of military service. I'm not exactly fond of saying it myself either. But like, yeah, that thought had occurred to me hearing this stuff and the, and the impunity and the fact that like, you know, it sounds like there's more of a penalty paid for going out and seeking psychological assistance for, for issues than there is for, you know, defrauding or committing crimes or doing war crimes or whatever like it i don't know i feel like that's i'm oversimplifying but just that this isn't this isn't because one dude you know a couple of bad dudes got away with it like this wouldn't be self-perpetuating over this length of time to this scale if it wasn't just sort of fundamental to the enterprise absolutely and i think if there was one thing you could one correction that you could make it's, to, it's that we remove this presumption of just automatic secrecy for anything that having to do with special forces. Like, everything that they do is secret. And the, I don't really think that that's justified, um, especially when you're talking about stuff that's going on stateside. Um, and I, I think that, you know, the, the sort of entitlement to, to secrecy that you see from units like JSOC is just, it's pretty breathtaking. And I don't think, you know, the case of uh, Billy Levine, you know, they haven't solved any of these crimes as I mentioned earlier. We, here we have the CIA adjacent JSOC super soldier suspected of trafficking drugs, who we know murdered somebody, who we know had been arrested a half dozen different times. Don't hold your breath for CID to be solving that one anytime soon. I don't think we'll ever figure out who it was. And I think it's really important to emphasize, you know, before we end things that whoever killed Billy Levine... Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and be an irresponsible journalist here and just say something that I believe that I can't prove, which is that the, that murder, it, it looked pretty professional in the sense that it used a cutout in the form of Timothy Dumas, who was disposable, who was the guy who actually pulled the trigger, um, and then who was wrapped up himself, um, at, tied off as a loose end. Uh, that's a very professional way to, uh, to eliminate somebody. Um, so take that, you know, take that as you will. But there was the third person there in the woods that night or that morning. I, we don't know exactly when it took place, but there was someone else who was there who knew exactly what they were doing. They killed Timothy Dumas and they probably contracted the hit on Levine. Why did that take place? I think whatever the answer to that question is, it would be 10 times worse for the military than anything that I've written in, in, the, in, the, in the story. No, I believe it. I absolutely believe it. And and I appreciate the something that I really appreciate about the piece. And I strongly encourage anybody who listens to this episode to go out and read that piece, which we'll link to in the show notes was the thoroughness. Like it wasn't just, Hey, I pulled a press release. Like you were knocking on doors, like you were interviewing folks in Spanish, even like just going and finding the people who were involved, even if they didn't want to be found. I really appreciate the attention to detail in the story. And 
This is Francis and I have recently tried to make this show a little more fun sometimes, but this is one of those episodes where it's like, fuck, we kind of have to talk about the ugly side of this. And yeah, I I think I think now that Afghanistan is supposedly coming to a close, there's going to be a lot of reckonings that are happening um, because for for 20 years, we pretty much did whatever the fuck we wanted um, in these countries. And you know we're we're starting to see that the um blind support for the military is starting to waver and whether that's politically motivated or whatever it doesn't matter because it's happening um and we're going to start seeing more stuff like this we're going to start seeing more people say why are people you know men and women getting sexually assaulted and you know raped on our bases why are these people doing these things and maybe it's not going to be everything changes tomorrow but I do, I do hope with, with things like this and, and Seth, I want to echo Nate's uh, appreciation for this piece because it is like, it, it is a very in-depth piece and very important piece about a lot of things that I'm sorry, you, that our listeners, you don't know about this until you read. It. I didn't know about this. Yeah. I didn't know about any of this. Shit All happening. of my friends are still in, insane. from the army are still in special forces. I've never heard of any of this. Well, you know, it gives me no pleasure to, to report it. That's for sure. Um, and, you know, I think that, well, I, I don't know. I, I really don't know what can be done about it. Uh, you know, again, I just returned to the same point, repeating myself. It's just that the, the secrecy stuff has got to, it, the presumption of secrecy around all of this, I think, should end. Um, and also, I think that they should take, a, I think that there should be more pressure put on the local, local law enforcement in Fayetteville, Cumberland County Sheriff's Department. Can't emphasize enough how totally uncooperative they were. Military is a lot nicer. You know, they at least make a show of trying to cooperate. They will provide you some details. Keith Lewis's unit, they did tell me some things about his service record. You know, even Yusasak in the end was said, you know, claimed that that Levine had been, um, that he had been subject to some kind of administrative discipline, which, by the way, you know, I cast some doubt on that before, but because he was so close to retirement, it wouldn't surprise me if in as of 2018, they had totally sidelined him. I mean, in Delta Force, you can get, you can be kicked off Delta Force for anything. anything. Yeah, I mean, the, you are quick to lose your spot there. It's a, it's a really a temporary assignment. Um, and if you fuck up once, you look at somebody wrong. If you have any questions about your judgment, that's it. You're done. So it, it wouldn't surprise me at all if he had been sidelined as of 2018 um, and then placed under administrative discipline. But the, 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 the fact that the local police and that the local sheriffs won't say anything about any of these crimes that they investigated. Um, that I think is really wrong and is totally unjustified and they've got nothing to hide behind. Um, they should open up their files and tell us why they determined that the killing of Mark Leshiker, which was in their jurisdiction, which at Fayetteville, excuse me, a Cumberland County detective um, opened that case. It was recommended to the homicide department. They received it. They had to open a file. They had to interview people. They then close that file and rule that justified homicide and won't turn over the contents of that investigation to anyone. Why is that? Under what, you know, what, what's their justification for keeping that a national security secret? They have none. It, it's the same thing with Sarah Lewis's phone, which they seized. Why are they holding it on? Why won't they give the phone to her mom? Sarah Lewis's mom is the legal executor of her estate. She has the legal right to that phone. They won't give it to her. They won't even talk to her. So that's, it's really rotten over there. Uh, I think that's to be the first stone to turn over. Well, Seth, thank you so much for for taking the time out to come talk to us about this truly remarkable piece, and highly recommend everybody goes out and and reads it. It's going to be in the show notes, but um, yeah, it's very eye opening and uh, horrifying, but also not surprising, not too surprising in in its own ways. But uh, it is definitely uh, go and take all of it in and uh, and go be mad at the army some more. <laughs> well, I appreciate you guys so much for having me on. I wish, wish I could stay and talk about it longer. I actually have, I'm 30 minutes late for an appointment at the DMV. I have to go get a <laughs> driver's license taken. It's the most uh, uh, quotidian uh, thing I've got to do today. Um, otherwise, I would love to stay. And no, I'm, I'm a half hour late on getting back to work from lunch. So you're fine. hundred percent. Thank you. Thank you for going long. Thank you for sticking on with us. And, and thank you so much again for, for the, the, the report that you put together. Zoom, zoom.